This presentation is brought to you by BenLowry.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wake Up Call. Today we've got another special guest on the show, Cal Molinay. How are you doing, Cal? I'm doing well. Thank you for the invitation, Ben. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's great to have you on the show. And how would you describe yourself in your own words? Uh, <laughs> um, I used to talk, describe myself kind of like uh, like tall, dark, and gruesome sort of thing, but mostly uh, uh, it's, a, it's a kid with a baboon heart and a feather in his hair. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, as a human being, right, I guess uh, there's no such thing as police, uh, Americans, as Bolivians, as uh, your friends or family, the only thing that exists is, is our people. Um, so the bigger group that I'm, I'm a part of is really humanity, I would say. So um, as an individual person, it's how would I would describe myself. Um, sure. And within that, would you categorize yourself as an anarchist specifically or not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, kind of in the same way. Frederick Douglass and all the people in the past uh, would describe themselves as abolitionists. And, uh, and the way Stefan Molyneux uh, perfectly wrote it as succinctly is that um, I don't know anyone today that advocates for slavery, right? When those values are pushed forward, it never goes back. And uh, once we all become abolitionists, that kind of word and meaning kind of goes away in the past. And the day will come soon in our lifetime that we all become anarchists. And that word and meaning will kind of go back in the past too. But the balance that we're pushing forward is more than just slavery, it's more than just uh, LGBT issues, it's more than just uh, child abuse issues. We're, this is something we have to push all of these values forward, all values of equality, um, to get to where we need to get, to get to the day that Anarchy Day can be celebrated every day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so that's, that's kind of what, uh, what we're doing here in Richmond um, with Liberate RVA. Um, pushing all these values forward, uh, uniting everyone together instead of dividing. I mean, that's what the state wants us to do. They want to divide us. They want us to separate us. They want us to call each other different types of group and subdivide. And so that way we can never unite. That way we can never, you know, uh, t uh, defeat the matrix, uh, if you will, right? Um, but yeah, uh, you're, from, you're from England, right? Yeah, I'm from England. And um you know, I, 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 I often say that I'm not a particular expert on any of this stuff. I'm just enthusiastic about promoting liberty and freedom. And that's all I'm really trying to do, you know, and interview different people and get people's different opinions uh, with regarding, you know, human liberty. And so <laughs> as, you uh, yourself? how would I describe myself? Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. I thought I was interviewing you. Oh, well, oh, cow. <laughs> I'm serious, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let me think. Uh, yeah, well, I definitely I, I'm very passionate about this distinction between voluntary and violent interactions. So I would definitely categorize myself as somebody who is peaceful, somebody who is not willing to use force or threats or coercions to get my own way. And so I would categorize myself as someone who's ambitious, um, who who wants to achieve things. And I don't think there's anything wrong with accumulating wealth and wanting material things, so long as you don't do it by initiating force and, you know, forcing forcing money out of people. So um, I believe I'm pro-market, pro-business. I believe in providing services and, and, and getting paid in return. So that that's kind of where I'm coming from. <laughs> No, no, I like I like your format. Like I was looking at your website and all that stuff. I've been watching some of your videos, uh, especially the recent one you had with uh, voluntary uh, virtues or values. Um, the most recent one. That's, I like that. I like because I mean, like uh, like the, a lot of the stuff you talk about. We have all the answers. We have all the alternative, non-violent solutions. Um, and the bridge and the gap there, I've, I've noticed, um, is how to get those ideas to people, right? To understand, to open their minds, right? Um, to see that there's more solutions than what the state provides. Because the state only provides us one solution, and that's violence. Mm -hmm. One solution to solve every problem, every complex problem, everything, through one way, and it's violence. Because it's even funny through more violence, mm -hmm. right? At no point can you say, I want to help the poor, but I don't want to fund war. You have to give them your money. You have to give them your property. Because if you did have a choice, they wouldn't threaten you with cages. If they could send Wesley Snipes to jail for evading taxes, they could certainly send anyone else to jail, to cages, be dehumanized, right? Yeah, um, I, com I completely agree. In fact, recently I had a similar thought to that. I think I said, you know, it's impossible, it's completely hypocritical to be in support of law and also to be in favor of freedom. Like, that's two opposite things, right? So. I, I can't remember how I phrased it, but it was like, you know, it's like choose, you know, you're either going to be pro-freedom and not support law enforcement or, 
Or, you know, you can't have both kind of thing. No, we can have a society of rules. Right. We can have a society of rules. Right. We can have a society of non bias of, of ostracism is most, our most powerful weapon. Yeah. It's any of violent aggression. Mm. Um, when everything's privatized, where are you going to go? Right? No one's going to house you, feed you, clothe you, invite you to their home, interact with you. Right. You saw what they did to Rush Limbaugh for something sexist. One little thing, saying one sexist thing. He could have got away with that maybe 10 years ago. But today, these values are being pushed forward and forward and forward. Look at what the Dan Savage did to Senator Santorum. Right? Uh, violated his last name. Santorum is now, oh, just Google his last name. Uh, there's different ways we can combat these sort of stuff. Uh, Chick-fil-A just came out recently. I heard this this past week. Um, well, a lot of homophobic messages that they're putting out there and their values. And now there's a retaliation against that. Not violent. There's, I mean, it's all voluntary. You don't have to eat a Chick-fil-A. But you can go on YouTube and post a video against it. And uh, there's this one really awesome video. Um, if anyone wants to look it up, Chick-fil-A. Um, I guess uh, this is a group of uh, three singers and they kind of making music videos. I think it's got over a million hits already in the past few days alone. Oh, right. um, that's a, those are, we have solutions and plurality of solutions to combat this sort of stuff too. And I feel ostracism is the most powerful way to defeat the state. The same way we defeated, um, well, the KKK. A few decades ago, they numbered in the millions, millions, millions of members. Today, there's just a few thousands left. They have a hard time recruiting the youth. Um, and again, because uh, I don't know anyone today that advocates for slavery in the same way one day, very soon, people are going to draw that moral line in the sand and say, you know what, look, friend, mom, dad, I've tried to show you. It's been three months now, right? I can no longer be friends with the status more than I can be friends with someone who's racist, who's homophobic, who's sexist, right? Someone who's, who's a bigot, someone who has all these prejudices and all this stuff. Um, but it's not to say in a free stateless society, if you have these feelings and such, that you can't come back in. If you have uh, anger issues, it's like we want you to come back to society, but you have to take anger management classes, right? Uh, there'll be a lot of nonprofit organizations that say, hey, um, let's talk about this, right? You need therapy. You need help, right? We, well, let's understand where these ideas came from. You know, what kind of childhood did you grow up in? What, were your parents racist? Were they also sexist, right? Let's understand and let's discover this and let's, let's heal you. Let's help. Right? We want you to be part of society. We want you to be part of our community. And it's not so much a permanent ostracism. It's like until you can get that stuff in check. and um, Otherwise, you're going to have to keep that in secret. Because uh, you raise your children with those kinds of uh, negative values, they're going to find that they're not going to be marketable uh, in the job market. Uh, today, people are getting fired for writing racist rants on Facebook. Uh, there was an incident several weeks ago in Chicago where this employee uh, wrote this racist rant on her Facebook wall. Somebody took a snapshot picture, sent it to her employer, and her employer told her, like, listen, you don't have to delete that, right? It just looks, looks bad for us, especially since it worked for us. And she said, whoa. She's like, you, don't, you can't tell me what to do, especially this is my private life. And then they just respond, okay, you just don't have a private life in our business anymore. We put out a press release statement that says, you know what? This is not our values. We don't support racism. You know, we just fired her. She does not represent us. And this is the first time businesses are actually pushing forward values. Do you look at... um? Uh, what Starbucks saying, you know what, anyone wants to be able to get married, regardless of your gender, right? Businesses are finally pushing values forward, and that's what we need. We need to push all these values forward, but more than just one issue, but all issues of equality, more than just the violence from the state, but the violence we do to each other, the violence we do to children, spanking, right? If it's wrong and immoral to, to hit an adult, you call that an assault, but when you hit a child, you call that spanking, you call that discipline, but you can't show me again. Uh, adults without showing me individual people. You can't show me children without showing me individual people. Only individual people exist and it's wrong and moral and evil to initiate that aggression on anyone, regardless how old or young they are. Um, and a lot of the stuff is what Liberate RVA is about. Finding uh, a real freedom movement for anarchism. Something we can all unite and go behind. Uh, I would say that true anarchism, true, true anarchist value uh, voluntarism over coherence. Um, they value rulers without rulers. Rules without rulers. They value the non-aggression principle against initiation of force. Um, freedom versus statism. Uh, these are true anarchism values. And the best way to get these ideas across, I, I feel, is through peaceful communication. Not by mocking them, not by insulting them, not by pushing them in a corner where they're going to hold on to their status beliefs because you allow them no way out. Right? That's the best way to bring to free their minds because the state exists in here. You can't show me the state. You'll show me a white building. You'll show me people holding guns in green costumes. That's all you'll show me. You'll show me people, right? Only people exist, and we need to bring them to our side. 
We need to bring them to our cause. Um, I was in the military too. Um, I, I posted a video a while ago. Uh, I did my four years active duty and then four years inactive duty. And, and then the National Defense Authorization was packed over New Year's. Right when everyone's distracted, right when everyone's uh, inebriated, right? The, it's a really good distraction to do it when everyone's celebrating a holiday, like the Tet Offensive. Um, we have the same thing in Bolivia. I'm from Bolivia, so a lot of the same problems in Bolivia. And you have to realize anyone who's in the military, you're not defending your uniform. You're not defending my gun. You're not defending the Marines, the Air Force, the Navy, the Army. You're not defending the service. You're defending the people you love and care for back home. Those are the people you're defending. You're defending their freedoms. And if you look at the rate of the success of the military intervention that we have today, it's done nothing to defend our freedoms. We keep losing more and more and more freedoms while government keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? And then there's something wrong. You have to look at that. You have to look that my family is the one I'm out here to defend. Right? Not these symbols, not these USNC symbols, none of that stuff. Your family, the people you love and care for. That's why you join the military. That's why you're going out there and overseas. Right? You have to realize that we've been misled. I was misled. Um, that's why I had to let go of my uniform. I became, I mean, if I want to have integrity, I can't proudly display my military uniform, my green costume. That's nothing but an affiliation and a symbol. And, but to affiliation to a murderous organization, I have a display way up high, and then people, my friends, my brother, my sister, it's like, wow, Cal, but you say violence is not the way, but here you are idolizing this, this relic that you once wore. And it's like, yeah, that's true. And I realized I had to let that go too. I had to let that go. Um, it wouldn't make any sense if like, someone was in the KKK and no longer believed in their racist values and then left the KKK and then went out to march at protests against the KKK while still wearing the KKK Ku Klux uniform. Um, and I have to let it go. I have to let it go, let go of the state, let go of violence, let go of the idea that violence will set us free and turn to each other. Turn to your friends, turn to your family, turn to your community. Talk about freedom. Talking about freedom, encourage them to talk about freedom will create a community, right? Bring them into the fold and once they come in, you, you, you teach them, you, they learn all about the free market. <laughs> they learn about non-aggression principles. They learn about all the plurality of solutions, the answers that are not founded on non-violence that we already have that you already have on your show, that Stefan Molyneux already has on his free domain show, we have all the answers, we have all the videos, we have all the interviews, we have all the solutions. And so what we do in, um, in Liberate RV in Richmond, Virginia, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I guess it kind of just started for me kind of realizing there was no alternative group. Um, I've been to a lot of the Libertarian Party meetings, I've been, I was part of the Occupy uh, Wall Street when I moved to Richmond, Occupy RVA, I slept in uh, the plaza there, Kanawha Plaza here in Richmond. Um, and then, of course, you measure everything by success. It's like, okay, we've taken over the park. What now? Right? Uh, well, let's uh, set up camp. Okay, we've set up camp and tents. What next? How many tents do we need to set up before we end the state? Right? Um, no, now let's set up. Uh, I mean, uh, th these people, the, the problem is not, not nothing wrong with these people or anything. They're great people. They're brilliant people. They all mean well. They all want to find solutions. Um, but you can't try to imagine you can fix government through more government. It's like trying to infiltrate the government and turn it against violence when it's founded on violence. It's like trying to infiltrate the KKK and turn it against racism when it's founded on racism, right? How about we turn to each other? It's that's already founded on nonviolence and find solutions there, right? That's the group, that's the movement I wanna be a part of. And then looking around, it's like, that's, we have to, I, I need to do something. Um, my brother is, uh, he's just turned 18 this last month. The graduate from high school is going to New Hampshire. Uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in New Hampshire. He just came back from the Porcupine Freedom Festival. And, uh, and of course, I, I helped raise him with my sister, I raised him with my family. Um, and now that he's graduated, now that he's going to go out there into the world, right? Flying off the nest to, to create his own life. Um, and I realized that's not the world I really want to set him out to. Um, that's not the world where he, if he experiments with marijuana, if he experiments with the pizza plant or anything else, he'll be dehumanized and they catch him. He'll be kidnapped, arrested, thrown into a cage, a prison. At any point where he resists, he's met with more violence or even shot, murdered. That's the world I'm, I'm sending him out to, right? Um, and that's, that's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. For me as an older brother, for me as a, 
as a friend, to, to, for my friends. It's not just for him. It's for everyone I love and care about. It's not just for me. I mean, people say, well, if you don't like it so much, why don't you move, right? If you don't like it so much, move out of this country. I tell them, you know what? I'm not a coward. I am not a coward. You see all this violence around you. You see all this violence on your friends and family. You don't run away. You do not run away. I will not run away. You draw that moral line in the sand and say, you know what? Enough is enough. It's time for us to do something about this. It's time to end this finance. We can end this finance in our lifetime. It doesn't have to be generations from now. It doesn't have to be a Google search image 100 years from now. It's like, this is the 21st century. These are the people fighting for their freedoms. It's going to be me, 80 years old, still holding a sign, you know, enough taxes, you know, uh, let me smoke weed. And so what? So what if we can finally smoke weed? How long did that take? Decades. And how many more freedoms did we lose in the meanwhile? So what if we can repeal one little tax? How many more taxes did they impose on us at the same time? So what if we can repeal one little law? How many more laws did they put upon us? That is not a measure of success. And instead of investing all that time and energy and commitment and resources and spending decades trying to get Ron Paul elected and spending time, so much time, you could have easily just turned to each other and to your community and you could have turned them into anarchists. You could have turned statists into anarchists. You could have brought people into this movement for to risk your lives. This movement, no one needs to die for this. This is a movement that no one, no one needs to be arrested or caged or kidnapped. This is a movement that can take place anywhere where you are at this very moment. It can take place at a cafe, um, at a restaurant, at a bar, at your very own home. Because the government can never prevent you, can never arrest, can never stop or destroy or prevent you and I from simply talking to one another. And that's, that's how we do this. And then you encourage your friends and your family and community to encourage their friends and family to talk about freedom. So in the matrix, free their minds. Talk about the hidden violence of the state. Talk about the hidden violence behind voting. Um, and that's, that's what we do now in Richmond. We, we have a, <laughs> it's a start off with a sign. I had no idea what to expect. A little sign that just said, ask me how voting is immoral. I'm not aggressing. I'm not coming up to you. I'm not yelling. I'm not provoking, antagonizing, nothing. And the meanwhile, I'm just studying. I was this is, uh, for my finals. This is when I so in between my classes. It's like, all right, I got to put an hour out there, put it out there. And all of a sudden, one by one, all of a sudden, there's a group already for me. All of a sudden, I met uh, my 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 first like one of the first real friends from this movement is um, uh, from doing this at VCU campus in Richmond, Virginia. Um, John, and he said, you know what? I'm gonna do this with you right off the bat. My first time talking to him after like 10 minutes. It's like. I want to do this with you. I was like, whoa, blown away. It's like, wow, really? It's like, yeah. It's like, all right, all right, let's do this. Let's do this together. Let's go to the campus. Let's go, let's, let's do this together. Um, and then just, it just started to explode from there. Um, we just celebrated Anarchy Day yesterday. Um, it's a way to reappropriate the 4th of July as our own very own holiday of celebration, much like how Christianity appropriated pagan holidays. In Bolivia, this is probably where I got the idea from. I'm from Bolivia. A lot of Latin American countries uh, reappropriated Columbus Day as uh, the day of indigenous resistance, right? But in the same token, I don't want to make this in a way we're mocking Independence Day. It's not fuck Independence Day. It's just Anarchy Day. You can have your celebration. We're, but we're also going to be open and receptive. You want to come join us too, you know, learn about freedom and all this stuff. Come over, right? Open your hearts. Open your doors. If you value the non-aggression principle, you're welcome. You're welcome. And we can talk about freedom. We can talk about all this stuff. I mean, that's, what, that's how they brought in the Grinch, right? <laughs> At the end of the story, their love, their compassion. That's how they brought in the Grinch, right? And that's what we need to bring everybody in. You can bring policemen here. You can bring people in the, in, who, are, who are in the government into your movement, right? Maybe right now they have to be anonymous, but once this finally becomes a majority, they all start coming out of the closet and say, you know what? I'm an anarchist too. I believe in this too, right? Uh, when we stop believing in the state and start believing in each other, it starts with first believing in yourself. People want to change the world, but it starts at home. It starts at home. It starts with yourself. Believe in yourself. I believe in myself. But violence ends with me. Right? You turn to your friends and ask them the same question. Right? Are you telling me that the only thing that's preventing you from harming me are laws? Right? I thought we have a friendship. I thought you loved and cared for me. Are you telling me that the only thing that's preventing you from harming me is the state? Are the gods? Right? I thought we had something more than that. You know, I thought our friendship was founded on more than that. Right? You turn to your mom, tell them about taxes, like taxes, you know, don't pass the gun off to the politicians, you pass it off to the police to do your violence. Don't be a coward. If you're going to use the gun, point it at me and take my money. Point it at me, mom. Would you point the gun at your own son? My friend, for a long years, would you point the gun at me? You know, sister, brother, 
stranger. And you'll find that even strangers, we share the same values. And I met one person that says, when I ask these questions to, to them, do you use violence in your day-to-day -day life to solve problems? I've not met one person that says, yes, I, I do. The question is not, have you ever? The question is, and your day-to-day life. So it shows that you already have a plurality of solutions, nonviolent solutions. You may get angry, you may be aggressive, you may smash things, but you never cross that threshold, right? You never cross that threshold to put someone in an um, involuntary position without their consent, without their choice, right? Um, and that's, that's the first question. The second question, do you have a right to self-defense? So the second question is, with the exception of self-defense, of yourself and others, would you consider it wrong and immoral to initiate that violence onto other people? And everyone says, yes, yeah, absolutely, that's wrong. Because self-defense is not really violence, it's self-preservation. It's uh, protecting your property. Because property rights begins first with owning your body, owning yourself. The third question would be, perfect, we're almost there. It would be, uh, would you therefore consider it wrong and immoral to violently force your ideas onto other people? And everyone says, yes, absolutely. And then, so tell me how it's voting any difference, right? In your day-to-day -day life, you use plurality of solutions to solve problems, and society wants to solve problems too. And government says, well, if they're voting, you can solve problems. So people vote with their ideas to solve problems, and in, in effect, they elect a politician. That politician's job, their only job, his or her only job, is to legislate those ideas into laws. And those laws of ideas are backed and enforced by the police at a gunpoint. And with any time you refuse, any time you resist, Anytime you smoke a piece of plant, you're met with violence. You're kidnapped. You're caged. You're dehumanized. And this, finally, the United States is number one at something, right? <laughs> Incarcerating its own people, kidnapping and caging its own people, right? Draw that moral line in the sand and say, enough is enough. Take the courage, have the integrity, and to stand up for us, right? Stand up for against the state. Stand up, but stand up for children. Stand up for each other. Stand up for yourself. Um, and that's what Liberate RVA is about. <laughs> uh, no one has to die for this. No one has to die for this. No one needs to be kidnapped or arrested for this. Being thrown into a cage for six months and 12 months just to make a point, all of that time is wasted. How much freedom can you talk about to other people when you're being locked behind in a cage? Six months gone, those could have been six months. You could have turned status into anarchists and brought them into this movement. Six months lost. And every time, every moment is precious right now. We know what's happening in Europe. It's not going to be long before it comes to the United States. And we still have time to say this. We still have time to overturn this. We still have time to turn the tide. We still have time to defeat the matrix, to free everyone from the idea that violence will set us free. And that's, that's, that's all this is. That's what the movement's about. Um, there's over, I think, 160 people now celebrating Anarchy Day all over the country. Uh, I, I think I saw your invite if you accepted too. So now it's part to England, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, Cal, you're a, you're a really great speaker. I mean, the way you the way you phrase all that, you're uh, you're really enjoyable to listen to. I think you got a gift there. You know, it's, it, you're powerful. That's really cool. Um, and uh, by the way, I just want to remind people, you're you're You've got a couple of videos on YouTube on your YouTube channel, Renegade Boy SCT. Yeah, the Renegade Boy Scout. I was once a Boy Scout, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've got a couple of videos on there, and I just thought they were great. You, you, you just mentioned one of them where you, you filmed yourself with the sign saying, um, where you asked the question, ask me how voting is immoral, and then people were coming up to you, right? And that, So people can watch that on your YouTube channel. And there was another one called Letting Go, where you burned your, unif your, your military uniform. And it was just incredible. I mean, uh, I, before I began this interview, I kind of came home and sat down at my desk and switched the computer on. I was a bit blasé, like, oh, yeah, going to do an interview. And I thought I better watch a couple of videos of this guy just to familiarize myself with, you know, just to kind of get into his so I know who I'm, who I'm going to be talking to. And I saw that video and I, I was kind of speechless. It was just really powerful. I really enjoyed it. You're a class act. I liked it a lot. Um, <laughs> so so your website, we want to tell people, is Liberate va.com right yeah 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 cool yeah. So, uh, and tell us about anarchy day yesterday on the 4th of july so what happened it was a blast it was it was amazing uh everyone came um those people came in later after the photo shoot 
I just wanted to make sure we had enough light to do the outdoor photo shoot. Uh, so more people came in later afterwards too. Um, we had a bonfire. Um, I built a fire pit, so we're roasting marshmallows. Um, we had a grill. It was a lot of fun. My sister was there. My family, they're all anarchists. They all came. Uh, my best friend, Rachel, my, my girlfriend, Sarah, all, a lot of my friends came. Um, and they even brought new friends too. It's like uh, curious about this stuff, and that's that's what it is, right? Just be open. Just 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 consider. I'm not saying you have to believe in this right now, but I'm not forcing it. And uh, you know, if you have more questions, let's talk about this, right? Let's talk about what the free market is. Let's talk about what the non-aggression principles. Let's talk about all these different solutions that we have, right? Invite them in out of curiosity, not out of forcing people, not out of yelling at people, not saying like, hey, you're dumb because you don't get it sort of thing, but just invite them in. And then they start accepting because if you do that, their mind shuts down. They don't. When you insult people, they don't want to hear what you have to say anymore, right? Their ideas go in the air, out the other. And the way you started off is kind of using um. Well, it was for me. It was uh coming across the Fon Molly News uh, universally preferable behavior like a year and a half ago or two, um, and I was like, that's. I love debating. I love arguing. But when I came across that, that moral argument just blew all my arguments away. Uh, <laughs> That's when I made the transition from, I guess, from being a menarchist to an anarchist. Mm. And uh, it's like that. It was, it was the strongest argument. It was the strongest uh, weapon. And it just so happens to be righteous. It just happens to be for good, for the light, mm. um, to free people. It so happens to, to be the right way to do things instead of arguing from a fact and efficiency. You can talk about statistics and facts, but that goes in the air, not the other. You can still use it, but you, I find that you can start off with the moral argument first. And then throw in everything you know after that. And then people get it then. All right? Set up the rules, right? Like in boxing. Nothing below the waist. No ear biting Mike Tyson. We have the rules. We agree to the rules. And then we can box. We agree first when you ask the three questions that violence is not just wrong and immoral, but evil. That there is no difference of opinion. That we already decided that there's one and the other. Violence either wrong or moral and evil or is good or just or righteous. But everyone agrees the other one. And then we can talk about the hidden violence of the state. And after that, so that the state only knows how to solve problems to one way versus the plurality of nonviolent solutions you use in your day-to-day -day life. And then after that, people start asking questions out of curiosity, not out of fear, out of curiosity. Right? You're, you're already in, you've already planted the seeds of freedom in their minds. And that's what it is. It's just planting seeds. Um, and you can never go back. Once you start seeing the matrix more and more and more, eventually... It's it's like welcome, right? It's like yeah, no idea. Yeah, I had no idea too. I had no idea too. I was misled too. We're all born into the matrix. We're born with social security tax at the end of our toes when we're born at hospitals. We're born into a world of violence because we're born into statism. All right, it's not their fault. We're born into that. We're born into a world that they tell us that we can't trust each other. We're born into a world that says, you know what? Any one moment, you know, because there's no laws, your friends and family they'll all harm you and hurt you. It doesn't have to be that way. We, we, can, we can change the whole way the media looks at anarchism. It doesn't have to be about all handkerchiefs or anything like that and going out there and smashing the state and steal from businesses. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, we can overturn this. We can take this back. We can win this, this war. We can win against this evil. But it only starts if you start believing in yourself that violence ends with you. And then turn away from the state and turn to each other. Doing that, so in the hidden violence of voting, once you bring them in, you can tell them all about the free market and everything. It's like, wow, that makes so much sense. I want to learn more. Well, hey, go to Ben Lowry's website. He has a lot of great stuff there. Go to Stefan Molyneux's website. He has a lot of great stuff there, right? All the answers are there. I just need you to, to take this little red pill, right? <laughs> and, uh, and just come on in. Join us, right? That's all. That's what Anarchy Day is about. It's uh, not about mocking, insulting, just celebrating our own holiday, right? One day, one day, very soon, Anarchy Day is going to be every day. Just like when we ended slavery, the end of slavery day was pretty much every day, right? And we all became abolitionists, and one day soon in our lifetime, we all will become anarchists. We all will finally have freedom, and there'll be nothing to hold us back, right? The moon is the farthest that the state will ever get us. And how long ago was that, right? I seek more beyond the moon. I seek the stars. I seek past what we can see, past beyond the telescopes that we can see of the world all around us. And there's so much we've yet to learn. There's so much we've yet to, to discover. There's so much cures we've yet to uh, create and solve. And the state is only holding us back. It's the de-civilization of humanity, right? End the state, end the violence, end the system, and no one 
can force their ideas on you. No one. Businesses can't force their services on you. No one. Corporations will cease to exist. Their, corporations are government-created um, mutations anyways. So without the state, without the state laws, there's no such thing as uh, escaping from personal liability. Right? Um, and then finally we can use everything we know to solve all these problems. About the roads, about the schools, everything. Everything will just come in naturally. Just like it did when we ended slavery. Um, so yeah, Anarchy Day was a lot of fun. Uh, my girlfriend made anarchy cookies too. Uh, it, was, it was great. It was, it was fantastic. Oh, yeah, I saw those. Is that with the, the A? The, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I put that on my Facebook. That was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really good. Really good. Wow, Cal, I mean, you, you've covered so many things, and I agree with everything you said, and there's so many things I want to ask you to, to get you to elucidate more on. And is it okay if I throw up a couple of questions and, you know, just get your response on it? Is that okay? Yeah, ask away. Because, you know, there's some common objections, because, um, you know, some people might be listening to this, and they might not be familiar with a lot of this. So let me throw up a couple of obje objections. Um you know, anarchy, uh, surely that means like chaos and disorder and smashing stuff up. Is that what it means? Uh, that's a wonderful question, and I'm going to answer that one second. My sister, uh, I have not told her anything about anarchy. Uh, this has happened recently, like in the past month and a half. And between studying for finals, also was taking summer classes. The first three weeks of uh, last month was nothing but compressed uh, studies and doing all these assignments for the first three weeks. So. For, for the most we've done so far, we've done a lot. Uh, so my sister wrote this one thing, though. Uh, I'll, I'll read it verbatim. Uh, she surprised me. She posted this on my wall. And when she did that, I was like, I had no idea you were following this on my Facebook wall or on my website. She lives in D.C. I live in Richmond. So sometimes um, I can't go up there frequently. But she's been following this. And she wrote this. Uh, her teacher asked her a question, right? If you can uh, change one thing about government, what would it be? My sister wrote, she's 13 years old. She wrote, Nowadays, there is one civil rights struggle that is important when the word anarchy comes to mind. Some think of the word disorder, but others, including me, think of freedom. I feel that the government has no right to control the way we live. For example, when a person doesn't obey a police, they are grabbed and pretty much kidnapped and are put in a cage, a jail cell. I feel that anarchy is the way to live, and that is my full opinion. Uh, currently in Richmond, there's a group called Liberate RVA, and they're fighting for anarchy. And I was like, oh my god. She took a picture before she turned in the assignment. She said there's more in the, si in the, the side, but she didn't have time to turn it in. And I was like, blew my mind away. Blew my mind away. I mean, even the word anarchy, uh, just define the word anarchy, right? If you want to talk about stuff, let's define the terms and context, right? Um, anarchy, an, means anions or cations without. Uh, Latin word for, I believe, for without. Uh, archy just means rulers, right? Like uh, monarchy, one ruler. Anarchy just simply means without rulers. We can have a society of rules. We just don't need the rulers. We just don't need the violence. We can have a society of voluntarism. We just don't need the coercion. We can have a society of values, of good, what is good. We just don't need what's bad and what's evil, right? We just don't need this that forces everyone to accept this stuff. We need a cultural revolution. We need a philosophical revolution. If you study history, you read the, you look at the patterns and every single violent revolution always ends up with replacing the state with another state. Replacing violence with a different kind of violence, right? Um, and, and even in the end, even if people want to do it through politics, you know what, even in the end, even in Lord of the Rings, Frodo could even let go of the ring. And power corrupts you. There's studies out there that says that Political power is more addictive than cocaine, right? Don't go that way. Drop the gun. Let go of the ring. Let go of boating. Turn to each other. That's what you need to accept. That's what you need to hold on to. Hold on to your friends and family. Hold on to your community. And just let go of violence. Let's let go. You'll find yourself to be more happier, more, more uh, stress relieved. Um, I don't know. I've, I've been a lot more happier in my life. I mean, philosophy is supposed to be like what's, uh, what's good sort of thing. Come to... Uh, Shared understanding of, of knowledge. It's a love for knowledge. But you can't do this on your own. You can't do this on an island. Um, philosophy is something that you share with other people, much like you share wine, right? Uh, much you share conversations or pieces of meal and such. And that's what we need to do now more. Um, go out there and just start talking to people. Start talking. To, after you talk to your family and friends, start talking to strangers. 
Go out there and just talk to strangers. And you'll find that there's nothing strange between you and them, that we actually share the same fundamental values um, that we've all believed in, uh, that we've been misled to believe that each other don't have. Right? This is something that even, um, you look at the foundation of philosophy, you look at Aristotle, you look at Plato, and they've, <laughs> this is where I, I believe where it started, right? They say, well, the only people who should rule are the philosopher kings, because they're the only people who can be the most virtuous. And I'm trying to understand, why, why, why did they write that in there? Why did, they, why did they say that? You look at the academy, the first higher education, you know, arguably in the Western uh, world, but that academy was exclusive. That academy was exclusive to the people who were very well politically connected, to the rich, to the aristocracy. Aristotle grew up in the aristocracy himself. He grew up with status lens. He grew up with the idea, already born into, that you can't trust people. You can only trust the state. So, of course, he's going to write a lot of his philosophy founded that people can't be virtuous too. Only one person should, and that's one person should rule over everyone. And I beg to differ. I beg to differ. That's not true. That is not true. All of us can be virtuous. All of us can be good. All of us can be philosophers just as well. Right? Just stop, just uh, turn away from that, those ideas. Create new ideas. Uh, Liberate RVA is just something new, new ideas. The things that you talk about too in your show, new ideas. Things that nobody really thought about a long time ago. Things that have been hidden and sheltered and all this, all this knowledge gone away, like uh, Spooner, right? Like all these, all these other philosophers in the past hidden from us. Carl, let me ask you a question because some people might be listening to this and thinking it all sounds great, but it's kind of idealistic and human nature. You know, if we didn't have a government, people are bad and they'd end up, you know, we'd have criminals running around. And from a practical point of view, how do you think, you know, what's your response to that type of objection? So... They want to say the criminals are going to run around. Personally, for me, um, I didn't have friends before I moved to Richmond. I was always, I used to view people, I used to see the worst in people. I used to uh, distrust them. I didn't have friends growing up, not because I couldn't have friends. I didn't, I just didn't like people. I grew up that way. Grew up the way through high school. Grew up the way when I was in the military. Um, the military just perhaps exasperated that kind of viewpoint for me even more. Um, and then when I left, I, I moved to Richmond. I wanted to go to VCU, but it was actually the community here that changed my mind about people. It was people that actually um, <laughs> turned me from being the Grinch I used to be to something else. I started seeing slowly the best of people. I started seeing that actually no one really wants to harm me, no one really wants to hurt me. I've never, never had a situation of violence in Richmond in the past two years, over two years I've lived here now. Um, it wasn't that long ago. The first five friends on my Facebook, the first one was my mom. <laughs> um, it was people that brought me out of that because I found that they were really kind, they were really generous, they're very caring, they're very loving, right? They might have their own issues too, but a lot of the same issues we've, I've had too growing up. And I realized that at the end of all of these problems that we have in our lives, <laughs> at the end of that, you can point to violence being the common denominator. At the end of that, you can point to the state being the common denominator for all of these problems. That's the common denominator. Um, changed my life moving here to Richmond. Um, talking to people, people being kind and generous to me, and all this slowly, all my little defenses have started going away, and finally realizing that there's nothing but good people here. And so what if I get mugged? So what if I finally get mugged? In my 27 years living here, my first time getting mugged, so what? One black spot on the sun doesn't make it black. One, one person who commits that act of violence against me, I will not condemn my community. I will not condemn my friends and family. So what? So what if one person does it? He doesn't represent for everyone. He doesn't represent everyone. He doesn't speak for everyone, right? I'm sure he has problems, too, of his own that no one ever talked to him. I'm sure he grew up in a state of violence himself, too. I'm sure people, when people do violence, it's always out of acts of desperation. When people have violent revolutions, it's always out of desperation. Uh, my uncle from Bolivia, this is like his third time doing a, a coup. Uh, he kicked out a Goni and president of Bolivia several years ago back. Um, but they only replaced the state with another state. And we still have the same problems in Bolivia. And right now, this time, his coup failed, so now he's in hiding. And hopefully he's doing well. I wish I could tell him that violent revolutions never work. Um, but it, even if I were to tell him that, it would be too late. Even if he won and kicked out Eva Morales out of the palace, he had him um, cornered there for a while last week. Um, even if he succeeded again. So what? You need a, the values are not there first. You need the values there before you can have the revolution. You need the values there before we can change everything. 
And once we're all together, all these values, and all these values of equality, all these values against nonviolence, then we can finally do something. Then we can overturn the matrix and shut it down once and for all. Hold on a second. I agree, but I don't think that quite answers the concern that people might be feeling. Some people think that um, the only reason that we live in a relatively civilized, relatively safe society is because there's a strong government, you know, and a strong force of law which keeps it that way. And so if there was no government, if we're in a voluntary society, then there'd be all these opportunities for criminals and mafia to, to take over. And the only reason they're not doing that now is because there's a government. So could you speak a bit more specifically to that? concern. We can have security in a free and stateless society. You have all these businesses offering, you know what, we will not abuse you the way that the state police security services that they provide does to you. You can, you can uh, go out there, I mean, we see the videos, we see what they did to Rodney King, we see what the police services of that security that's forced upon us. We have to accept their terms of conditions, right? If it was a private enterprise, we can just reject it. We can say, I'm going to cancel my subscription, just like Netflix. They went up $10 more and then all of a sudden they're down right? People control businesses. People have the power, not the businesses, not the corporations, not this. Not, when we get rid of the state, we have the power, right? When you get rid of the state, the forced service that they provide about security, even if you have friends, for example, if that relationship is abusive and unhealthy, you cut off that friendship. If you have a friend who, uh, who's a female, for example, and you, or a male, it doesn't matter, and they're married, and if that relationship is abusive and unhealthy, you tell them, hey, get a divorce, end that relationship, right? There's better people out there, right? Um, better people with better values. Just, just cut your ties, right? You don't need to take that abuse. People encourage each other to do the same thing. And unfortunately, with the police services, the security that we provide, we can't even divorce from that, right? Even if it's unhealthy, even if they're abusive, we can't even cut, cut those ties. And we're forced, we're forced to have that relationship. We're even forced to fund it, right? We're even forced to accept it because there's no other alternatives. Yeah. There's no other all the security companies out there that can provide the same thing, right? And it doesn't have to be abusive in the way it is now. You can have a variety of different kinds and businesses will go out there and say, you know what, um, we'll never abuse you, you know, we'll never have an extra security guard, we'll never have an extra bullet. You can have a third party that checks on us, you know, if anyone discovers that we have an extra bullet in our arsenal, you win a million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. To give people the guarantee, the safe the feeling that it will never happen. And of course, since we have the power at that point, and we can cancel our subscription, we can cancel our payments, and all of a sudden the business goes down. You see what they do with, um, like McDonald's, for example. Someone finds a finger in the chicken, uh, chicken nugget or whatnot. Stock markets goes down, right? The business goes down. They lose profit. Yeah. And imagine if we can do that to all the businesses, cancel our subscription. The point of a click button. And yeah. we don't have to accept that kind of abuse from the security that's forced upon us by the police. We can have security in a free and safe society. But if there's a demand for it, if there's a, if there's a majority of people if there's people who want something, we can provide that, right? Uh, I mean, that's the foundation of democracy. There's a majority of people that wants to help the poor, so they elect a politician to pass these laws, welfare laws, to help the poor, right? So that's, that's by definition. Uh, Stefan Mali talks about the, the majority sort of thing. So, for example, if there's a majority of people that wants to date you, right, um, it would be considered wrong and immoral to enact legislation now to force everyone to date you. But clearly, there's already a majority that already wants to date you. Right? This would be considered wrong and immoral to now point at gunpoints and everyone so you have to date me now. Right? If there's a majority of people that wants to date you, you don't need to force them to do that which they already want to do. If there's a majority of people that wants to help the poor, you don't need to force them to do that which they want to do. If there's a majority of people that wants security, you don't need to force them at gunpoint to do that which they want to do. Right? And that's, sorry to cut in, but that's the beauty of capitalism is you vote with your money, right? That is, that is like the true freedom that people imagine when they use the word democracy you you get to choose that's that's what's great about the free market right yeah 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 you have quality you have real quality mm. yeah um, and, and I, I just want to interject if that's okay because uh, this is a, this is a topic i'm quite passionate about and um many people say you know if we didn't have police then who would you know we wouldn't have emergency services but people miss the point that it's illegal basically to compete with the pr police you can't you're not allowed to compete you're not allowed to provide a better solution to crime and emergencies and security and dispute resolution uh that's important distinction to notice isn't it yeah you're not even allowed to create your own money people forget that money is a commodity it's still a good money is a good mm. in the united states in 1913 when they monopolized currency before that 
there used to be a lot of different kinds of money. Banks had their own money, like little communities had their own money. There was a lot of different kinds of forms of currency. Is this all it is? This is a commodity. It's a form of transaction that has value that we all agree upon and let the best money win. But government, of course, wants to monopolize, monopolize every services, and they found an opportunity to do that. And once they monopolized it, created the Federal Reserve, seized the interest rates, and that's why today over 95% of the value of the dollar you have in your pocket is gone. That's why the poor can't save. You, you, you take away their um, sense of wanting to save, understanding to save, because it doesn't matter anymore. If you try to save, the value is going to go down anyways, right? And especially it hits the poor the hardest because they're the ones with a tighter budget. It exacerbates the condition. It exacerbates the poor. So the state creates poverty. It doesn't fix it. Yeah. It creates violence. Prohibition invited the mafia. Mm. Right? It invited all this violence. Mm. All these drug laws. Look at Portugal. Decriminalized every all the laws on drugs. Not from from heroin to cocaine to marijuana to everything. In the first few years alone. All of these problems went down. The drug uses went down. The diseases associated with these shirt needles went down because they found it wasn't a war on drugs. It was a war on people. It was a war on people who grew up in abusive households and war on people who, people who need help, not cages. Right? And over 10 years ago, they don't have the same problems that the United States does. Actually, the United States has a uh, rate per people, more, I believe, cocaine users than there are marijuana users in Portugal. You look at societies in, uh, in Europe that finally trying to uh, eliminate uh, all traffic signs, all stop lights, everything like that. And they found that accident rates went down. Right. They found uh, the traffic flow, you know, the congestion went, you know, went down too. Wow. Spontaneous order, right? It's interesting. So if we move the state out of the, out of the problems, out of all these solutions, everything works out. Everything comes to an equal equilibrium, a balance. Um, you don't need a loss to... To manage how you're going to move your shopping cart at a at a grocery store, right? People do that naturally, right? And there's I've never seen an accident at a shopping mall, and all this aggressiveness and all these accidents. And it's 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 uh, the state that invites violence. It's the state that involves accident. It's the state that involves death and murder and kidnapping and slavery and all these all these wrong solutions, all these immoral and evil solutions. Um, I hope that answers the question. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that was really insightful. Yeah, very thought provoking. I've got something else I want to ask you, and I guess maybe we'll wrap up in a little bit because we're getting near the hour, and I think that's a good length of time, you know, for for um, you know to keep it kind of punchy, kind of thing. Um, I want to ask you to reflect on your your thoughts about being in the military now because your your video was really powerful. So could you speak on that for a bit? Um, see, the problem in the military. Before you join the military, you have these illusions of freedoms. But once you go in the military, you have nothing. You have no freedoms. You don't even have the Bill of Rights. All of that is gone. You have to accept the orders. You have to accept the, the commands. You have to accept the written guidelines. You have no choice. Um, you have to hurry up and wait, pretty much. Uh, you can't speak out. You speak out, you see what happened to the people who speak out. They lose. They become honor, dishonorable to discharge. And the whole point of the military, really, anyone who joins, even if it's already too late, once they realize they've been misled by their own recruiters, misled by the media, and tell you what the military is like, once they're in, you kind of have to stick it through. You kind of have to keep shut about it. You can't speak your mind. You can't say what's on your mind because you're going to get in trouble. You're going what, to get right what would happen to you? Let, let's just say that you did speak your mind. I mean, what would happen? Because I don't know. I've, I'm not familiar. I've not been in the military. So. Uh, you pretty much become ostracized within your own community in the military, between the groups that you're with. Uh, sometimes, depending on the situation, you can get reprimanded. If you talk back to an officer, you can get an Article 15 for disrespecting a non-commissioned officer, for example. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of punishment involved. For example, in a in a private sector, right? If you didn't go to your job, you know, it's like, all right, maybe you call in a sick day, or maybe you just want to quit. They'll just fire. Okay, cool. They won't send you in a cage. They won't punish you for not going to a job. They'll just get fired. In the military, if you don't show up for your post, if you don't show up for these, for your time that you're in, you get in trouble. And for most cases, you go to jail. Oh, really? And military stockade, yeah. Um, if you keep refusing to obey orders, if you, you don't go to your post all the time, you're late, yeah. That's, that's the punishment. That's the way they handle things. You have to uh, listen and shut up and follow orders. <clears throat> right. So, I mean, that's the way I was, that happened to me. That happens to a lot of people. I mean, if you want to have a social life, sometimes you have to do it secretly outside of the military. Um, the whole thing is, uh, even though when you're in, though, um, even when you're ready to go, you have to you have to follow orders. You have to do all this stuff because you want to discharge. Because when you get out, that honorable discharge is um, 
you, you need that to be, I guess, uh, your skills and stuff like that when you get out of the military. So understand the situation. You have to do it. Um, let me put this to you, Carl. Sorry to stop you in mid-flow, but let me put it to you like this. What would you say to people that are currently in the military or maybe in the police? What would you say to them now if they're listening to this? Military and police. Well, the police are to provide security just as much as uh, to defend our freedom sort of thing, just, just to, to save our, to value human life. But they have to realize that the state doesn't care about human life. The state doesn't care about human life. They don't care about the animals. They don't care about the environment. If you think the United States care about values human life, you just have to look at the numbers of how many people they've murdered since the end of World War II. The United States alone has murdered over 30 to 50 million people, has taken their lives of over 30 to 50 million people. In what, in what way? Is that in war or what? It's the end of World War II, including wars, including everything. It's just this one country alone, right? And people want to say that uh, it values health care, like Obamacare and all that stuff. It doesn't even value human life. What makes you think they're going to value your health, right? Let's end the violence we do to each other and to that extension, we take better care of the animals. We take better care of the environment. We take better care of Earth. Let's take care of each other first. Let's end the violence we do to each other first. Uh, I was misled in the military too, with this whole nationalistic fervor when I grew up. In Bolivia, you have to join the military for one year, I think when you're 16. I came here before that, when I was seven or eight, and I kind of had the same ideas. Um, to join the military too, to defend my country, to do this stuff, uh, to earn you know those rights and all that stuff. And uh, when I was in, I was just I was misled. I was misled because after the National uh, Author uh, National Defense Authorization Act, look at the Patriot Act. We keep losing more and more freedoms, and that's not what it was about. We can still have a, a defense. We can still have a security of defense. We can still protect our family and our friends. We just don't have to do it that way. We just don't need the state to do it, right? Uh, we just don't need to go out there and, and go out there in all these other countries to do it. We could do it here at home. It's more uh, efficient and more effective to have a military that's more defensive, that's more interventionist. That's why they call Afghanistan the graveyard of empires, right? The Mongols couldn't do it. Russia couldn't do it. Uh, the United States couldn't do it because it's more efficient to get a $20,000 shoulder arm you know, missile launcher than to take out a $20 million jet, right? We can still defend ourselves, right? It's just we've been misled. And, uh, and of course, if anyone were to speak out right now, you just get locked up in you know, a stockade. So all I have to say is just, all I have to say is really just uh, understand what's at risk, understand what, what's really going on, um, and finish your tour and just get out. Do not, uh, don't sign up again. Don't sign up again. There is, a, there is a real life outside of the military. Go back to your family and friends. Go back to your community. Don't go back out there. Your family needs you here. Your community needs you here. They don't need you overseas. They don't need you risking your life and dying, right? They need you alive. They need you here. They need you standing up for what's right. They need you standing up for their, for their, for their freedoms here, right? Don't worry about the rest of the world, right? Real change, real freedom to, to liberate ourselves starts at home in our communities, right? Once, once we get this liberated, once we liberate this, this whole, all of our communities, through the extension, we start liberating all the other communities in the world. But first, let's focus here. Change first starts at home, right? So come back home. Don't sign up again. Come back home. Your family needs you. Your community needs you. Um, and as for the police, the same thing, too. I mean, you're out there to provide security, but you have to understand the situation. But the whole point of this is not having to quit your job. Even if you're in the government, the whole point is you don't have to quit your job. When you're ready to let go, you know, let go of your jobs. Let go of your work, your position in the federal government. The whole, this whole movement is not about quitting your job. Just because you're a slave and accept a meal from the state doesn't mean you condone slavery, right? But the first thing you can let go, because we're not forced right now to vote, unlike Australia, we don't have to participate. We don't have to participate. It won't be long, though, before they pass a law that says everyone must vote. It won't be long. So right now, while we have this chance, encourage people to give them a real reason not to vote. Instead of, I don't vote because of the Electoral College, I don't vote because it doesn't do anything, I don't vote because, hey, my voice doesn't count. Your voice does matter. You can use your voice to turn to each other and liberate them, liberate your community. We don't have to vote. Show them the hidden violence of voting and turn to each other. You don't have to participate in that hidden violence. You can participate in freedom. You can participate in a peaceful movement. You can participate in liberating your community. Right? This whole thing about voting, this whole thing about every four years, we have to pull the curtain, punch a little chat in, and then you step out of the curtain, people say, who'd you vote for? And you say, how dare you? That's a personal issue. And then you slap the I voted sticker on your shirt. And then no one talks about it for another four years. 
that's not the change I want. I can't wait that long. I need it now. I want it now. My brother's going up there. I'm sure you have friends and families. We can't risk uh, being dehumanized, right? This is our moment now. This is our generation. We have everything we need. We have the internet. We have ways to reach out to people. All it takes now is just the courage now to stand up for what's right. The courage to stand up against what's unpopular. The courage to stand up against the grain. And to, to have the commitment and integrity and to finally just do something about it. And you can. Every one of us can. You don't have to join the military to do it. You don't have to join the police to do it. You don't have to join the state to do it. You don't have to be a politician to do it. You just have to believe in yourself and just do it. Wow. Cal, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. I think you're a great speaker. I really hope you, um, you know, continue kind of perhaps making more videos and giving speeches and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying everything you're doing. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for the invitation. I uh, really love what you're doing. I re really, really love what you're doing out there, too. Um, you're spreading it out there in England, too. Um, and you're actually perhaps the only person I know outside of the United States that's doing this. I'm sure there's other people, but I have not yet to, um, to, to know who they are yet. But it's really great to hear what you're doing out there. You're spreading freedom out there in your own show, um, in your own ways out there, in your community, uh, liberating your community. That's, that's really wonderful. I applaud you for that. That's, you've been doing this for uh, how long now? Well, um, around about three years, but really uh, anarchism and non-aggression principle only about six months or 12 months or so. So I'm pretty new to it all, to be honest. That's, well, no, that's great. I mean, it's just, this, this movement just started just a month and a half ago. It wasn't that long ago either, mm -hmm. right? We can push all this stuff together. We can unite and we can push all these values and we can all finally, finally end the state, end the matrix. Mm -hmm. We can turn status into anarchism, but we can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. We, we need each other. We need to unite. We need to com combine our knowledge and everything we know and go out there and just do it. Go out there and just finally end this madness, end this funny, end the bloodshed. And no one has to die for this. Right? We can finally do this in a nonviolent, in the same way, the non aggressive principle. And we can finally actually do that and, and go all the way and go the distance. Cal, Cal Moliné, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope we get a chance to speak soon. Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll do another call at some point in the future and have another chat. But, uh, uh, yeah, thanks so much and bye for now. No, thank you so much, Ben. You take care. It's a pleasure to be on your show. My pleasure. Bye-bye, Cal.